Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data Webinar Series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will be joined by guest speaker Bob Hayes to discuss data science and business analysis. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our uh, Adrian. Adrian is the industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data, and Shannon, we lost you there. Shannon? <laughs> well, I can hear you, Bob. And I can hear you. I am Northwest University. When with that, uh, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started and to introduce our speaker for the, today. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Um, just chatting with Bob. We lost you somewhere in there, but I'm glad you're back. So I'll go ahead and give his his bio and we'll get started. Um, and welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here as always. This is the uh, what is it, third one of the year. We did a dozen last year. And so those of you that have been uh, with us for any of the events, the, um, the webinars know that I I guard the microphone pretty carefully, so this is a, a special day that we have a guest speaker. Um, I met Bob Hayes last year when IBM put us both on a panel at one of their events. And I was really impressed by uh, the things he talked about, about his own research on data science and scientists. So this year when I was putting together the agenda for the webinars, I thought it'd be great to have him on as uh, my guest for the topic. So let me give you the short version of his bio. And the, the full bio is on the... Um, the Dataversity website now. So Bob Hayes is the Chief Research Officer at Ipguri, where he's responsible for directing best practices research and communicating the value of their platform. His research is focused on the intersection of analytics, the practice of data science, which got me very interested, uh, and customer experience and success. You may know him from his talks, blogs, and books, and all of those are detailed uh, on his bio at Dataversity and should be in the package that we get after the, the webinar. Bob received his PhD in industrial and organizational psychology from Bowling Green University, specializing in survey research and quantitative methods. That was also something that impressed me because I can't tell you how much research um, I read these days that comes from people that obviously don't know what they're doing. So somebody that knows about quantitative methods is always of interest, particularly when we're talking about data science. Bob has over 20 years of consulting and research experience in enterprise and mid-sized companies, including Oracle, Agilent, Sophos, and a few others. And I'm really excited to share the platform today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob. Adrian, thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, and thanks for Dataversity for allowing me to uh, be here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, for the talk today, oh, first of all, on the front page, you see my email address. So if you have any questions after this, please feel free to email me. And also, feel free to follow me on Twitter or tweet anything you want uh, during this talk. So that, I was interested in data science for a long time. And I started my, my, uh, my work after grad school in the area of customer experience management and customer success. So I read a few books on that topic, focusing more on how companies can better utilize analytics and, and analytics-related topics to help improve how they manage their customer relationship. I blog regularly on the topic. I do research in the area. Uh, there, there's some information about me. Um, I'm the number one blogger on a site called Customer Think, where my blog is syndicated. Uh, I also focus on customer analytics. And I also uh, blog and do research in the area of big data and data science, as Adrian said. So with that, let's go dive right into 
Data science. So, so I was interested in data my entire adult life after my first stats course in college. So when the, this world of big data was, was coming into focus, and all these new terms are coming out, big data, machine learning, uh, data science. So I wanted to kind of put some rigor behind what those terms meant. <clears throat> so I focused right on this study. What, what does data science mean and, and what do data scientists do? What are their skill sets? So this is how I define data science, data scientist and data science. So it's a way of extracting insights from data using the powers of computer science and stats applied to a, a, a specific field of study. So it necessarily involves the collection, analysis, and interpretation of data to extract empirically based insights that augment human decisions and algorithms. So you need to be a data scientist that focuses on helping people make better decisions, or maybe data scientists that does activities to help uh, create machine learning algorithms to help automate work processes. So given that as a broad, defini broad definition of data science, I wanted to you know, ask data scientists, since I'm a, I'm a psychologist, and I, I do survey research and quantitative methods, I thought I want to apply data science techniques to the study of data scientists to see if we can get some insight as to as to who they are, what they do, and are there things we can tell companies to ensure that they're more successful in their data science projects. So hopefully in, in throughout this talk, you'll get some insight as to how, how you may improve your data science skills, how you may implement data science more effectively in your company, and so forth. So the study, I did a study about a little over a year ago when I was with a company called Analytics Week. And we, we, we have a, he had a huge new, newsletter I wrote a blog post on the on the topic, and I tweeted um, and shared through social media invitation to take the survey. And we got about 600, over 600 respondents for this particular presentation. As uh, to date, we have I think over 1,200 respondents who are still looking at the data and, and trying to make sense of it. Um, the 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 survey itself, and I'll I'll go into this actual topic, the uh, questions in, in a subsequent uh, slide or two. Uh, but, the, but the survey basically asks respondents to self-assess uh, on, on 25 uh, uh, skills related to data science. Uh, those include business, technology, programming, math and modeling, and statistics. I also asked some other questions around uh, demographic issues like their, their gender, their, their uh, highest level of education attained, their job role, things like that. And I asked another question, what, what was their overall satisfaction with the outcome of their analytics projects uh, on which they work? That's the, the pretty much the, uh, the variables we're looking at today. So the, here's a list of, of the 25 skills that we think make up data science. Now, maybe this is an exhaustive list, but it's pretty comprehensive, I, th I think. And I got these, uh, this list was kind of um, uh, uh, generated by these prior researchers at the bottom of, of this slide here. You see the references, the article called Analyzing the Analyzers by Harlan Harris, Sean Patrick Murphy, and Mark Vaisman. So, and these, the, the data science skills fall into five broad areas business, technology, math and modeling, programming and stats. Now the, the upper left you see business. So I, I focus on business as a subject area expertise because I focus on asking data scientists who worked in the world of work. Now if you want to study data science who work in other areas, you may want to ask questions about like, like oncology. If you have a data scientist trying to apply data science methods and big data methods in, to the field of, of predicting cancer, then you want subject matter expertise around knowledge of cancer. Okay, but here we're just going to focus on business. So for each of these 25 questions here, I had the respondents rate each of them on a scale from zero to 100, where zero means they have no, no knowledge of the topic, and 100 where they're an expert on the topic. Okay, and, I, and the thing is, I, I, I got this rating scale format from the National Institute of Health. I thought it was a, a really good way to, to hopefully uh, make these ratings more objective in a way, because if you look at uh, number 60, rating of 60, it tells you that if you give yourself a 60, you can do that skill on your job without any help, okay? And the higher the score you get, so 80 and 100, that means you can give more help to people around you. And below 60, 40 or below, that means you need help to do your job. So hopefully with, with these kind of criteria, these ratings are meaningful. And based on the results I, I, I found, 
I think these results are reliable and valid. And I'd like to do feature research to see if these ratings of proficiency in various skills are actually correlated with real objective assessment of these skills. And maybe we can talk about it in the Q&A section. All right, so next slide. So this is the, uh, the samples made up of primarily uh, data scientists from the B2B space. About 80% of them were from B2B, but 50 for only B2B and 30 for companies that were both B2B and B2C. Uh, most of the respondents also came from North America at about 64%, and most of the respondents were from the IT industry, education and science, consulting and healthcare and, and medical industry. Just to give you a sense of, of who I was surveying. Well, the first thing I do is I want to see what, what is the proficiency across all those 25 data science skills. So I coded expert is green, I'll be down to, to no uh, uh, knowledge in that is red. And I rank these from the most proficient to the least proficient. And we see the top 10 data, top 10 data science skills on the right there. What's interesting is that, I don't know if it's interesting or not, but it's just a fact that communication was the number one skill. So if you ask any data scientist, they believe that they are the most proficient on average in communication compared to any other of the, of the data science skills. The, the next skill is managing structured data, uh, data mining and viz tools, science and the scientific method, and so forth. <clears throat> and I'll get further on the, the presentation, I'll compare different kinds of data science to see if certain scientists have different skill sets. All right. What's interesting to know on the slide is that you look down below the, the 24th one that is big and distributed data. So even though in, we are in this big, big data world, uh, very few uh, quote, data scientists have expertise in that, in that uh, area, which I found surprising. And actually, there was a study that was done by, by Katie Nugget and looked at the, the size of, of databases data scientists typically use. And what, he, what they found was that data scientists typically uh, look at data that can fit on your, your laptop. So it's not, really, it's not really big, big data as you, as you would think. Okay, in the survey, I asked the response to identify their job role. Uh, they have uh, one of four options. Actually, they could choose more than one, but the four options were you're a researcher, you're a business management, you're a creative, or a developer, okay? And we, we see that in, in this sample, most of the, of the respondents identified as, as a researcher. Next is business management, uh, creative, and then developer. So I wanted to see how these different job, job roles differed in, in skill proficiency. And you see here uh, on this chart here, the, the, it's a spider chart. Red in the middle means you, you're, you have no proficiency or low proficiency. Yellow is kind of warning and green is when you're really, you're, at least you can do your job independently at work. So you see here, if you look at the business management, the, the orange one, they tend to be strong, which is no surprise, in business skills. See the, the, the top right part of this spider chart? They're above the, 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 uh, the 60 point criteria. Look at developers, they tend to be strong in technology and programming skills. And then researchers, not, not surprisingly, tend to be very strong in math and uh, stats skills. There's some overlap of different kind of roles, but typically that's what you see. And the creatives, the people who have identified as creatives didn't tend to be uh, strong in, in any one field. They're kind of like average in all skill areas in the middle. So I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but as we'll see later in the, in the presentation, is that the more proficient you are in these skills, the happier you are with your outcomes uh, on your analytics projects at work. So if you're a creative, you may want to uh, maybe dive deep in a given topic area and become an expert in, in that, whether it be stats, uh, 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 technology, or maybe even uh, in, in business management. Well, next slide. So, so let's go back. So these, these questions here, you know, the, these 25 lists were, were generated by, by myself and these prior researchers. 
And we bucketed them in what we thought was a pretty logical bucket. So it was five buckets, business, technology, programming, math, and stats. Now, we did, I did a factor analysis of the proficiency ratings to understand how these items kind of clustered together. And this is a popular uh, machine learning technique. Um, it's similar to principal component analysis. So the fact analysis, what it tells you, it tells you which, how many, how many underlying factors can describe the correlations among these 25 skill sets and also which of the skills is correlated to which of the of the factors so in this fact analysis i found a very clear three factor solution right and if you look at the loadings right here in the factor pattern matrix to the right you hear that the top five uh skill sets were for business they, they loaded on factor three and i labeled that business and i highlighted those those weightings uh with the yellow and we see down below we got uh, technology and typically they fell into the correct bucket that we thought, but there were two of them that that really should be measuring something else. So, for example, we thought machine learning fell into the technology bucket when in actuality it, it loaded more highly with other items that related to math and statistics. And likewise, the area of uh, of big and distributed data we thought was more of a technology. Uh, it is technology. I'm sorry. Uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, it's just machine learning, I guess. And also in data management, we, th we thought was going to be down below in, in, in stats. We thought it would be loaded highly on the stats skill, but actually it loads more highly on the technology and programming factor. So what this basically tells you is that the, the, even though we have 25 independent skill sets, they can actually be grouped into, into three separate clusters, meaningful clusters. And if you look at these, these factor loadings right here, those three factor loadings, we can actually plot those in a factor space on an X, Y, and Z axis. And I'll show you that on the next slide. You get a, more, a better visual sense of, of what I mean by, by having these three factors. So the, the blue ones, are, excuse me, the yellow ones are business. They load in a, a similar area. The items that load on tech and programming are kind of clustered together in this area, in the lower right of the picture. And the, the, uh, the math and stats also load together in, in one kind of area. And the implications for this is that if, if you're strong in, in any one of the math skills and you want to learn something else about big data or data science, I think your best bet would be to kind of focus on skill sets that are related to math and stats because you're already good at that. And people who are good at one tend to be good at, at other areas in math and stats. The same thing for technology. If you're good at maybe back-end programming, then if you want to learn more about data science, you may want to focus on more programming types of, of, uh, of skill sets that you want to develop in yourself. So here, here are the three kind of broad domains. This kind of supports what, what the data science and big data pundits talk about. We talk about the three data science skills. You got the subject matter expertise or domain expertise up top, followed by technology and programming, which includes these skills. And then finally, you have math and stats to actually analyze the data, okay? So instead of thinking about the, the, that, that Venn diagram, the, those three that kind of overlap with data science in the middle, I like to think of data science more like the, the chart here on the upper right, where it's more, it's a, it's a variety of skills you can have, and you, you may possess more than one or, you know, a few of them, uh, but, but, but think of skills as b being independent, and you can, you know, learn a lot about stats and not know anything about, about programming and technology, which is fine, and, and vice versa. And we take those three factors, and I, I do the same kind of plot. We see here again that, of course, business people on average have higher proficiency ratings for business type skills. Uh, the, the developers have higher proficiency in technology skills, the blue. In the lower left, see that, that the researchers are much more proficient in math and stats skills. Okay? And again, the, the creatives are kind of mediocre in, in all the three skills. They're not strong in any one particular skill. So let's look at each of these, each of those skills that, that are in each of those three general buckets of data science skills. And we see here, the, the, the chart here looks at, the, again, the proficiency rating on the left. And I drew this, the line is 60 with a dash. So if you're above that, you, you give help. If you're below that, you, you need help to do your job. And we see here that this is, these are business skills. And we see here that the business people tend to be above the, the level at which they can actually do their job. So that's good, okay? 
look at technology and math on the next page. Well, the top one is technology. We see here and blues are the developers. So the developers tend to be you know, more proficient in, in, in the developer skills compared to the other kinds of data scientists. And look down below, again, look at uh, math and stats skills. We see here that, again, researchers tend to be more proficient and, and above the, the 60 cutoff point across most of these, these skills. At least, at least they're higher than, than the other data scientists, other, other, data, other types of data scientists. So the implications for this is that, you know, not everybody is good at, at a, in everything. So pick your strengths and focus on that and be an expert in that area. And this is kind of a summary chart that looks at, at the various data skills, the, the, how competent you are for each of the four data science roles. And the bigger the bullet means that the, the more people are, are proficient in that area. So if you hear for business managers, and even you know, the other, other three, developer, creative, and researchers, the top skill, again, is communication. And what's interesting to note is that for the business manager, their top skill is, is, uh, is uh, communication. We have – that's hard to read. Let me maximize this. Okay, is, uh, is project management and business, business development. And for, for example, researchers, they're, they're very competent in communication, math, not surprisingly, data mining and viz tools, and science and scientific method. So you can give me a nice summary to look at where, where, where data scientists' strengths are. All right, let's go to the next slide. So, Okay, here we go. So, so I also asked a question on, of how satisfied each of the participants were with the, the job that they're doing at work. And we see here that there are significant differences between researchers and developers and business management folks. So researchers tend to be more satisfied with the outcome of their, of their projects around analytics compared to both business management and developers. And, and with, what I'm kind of surprised at how, how low the satisfaction is for, for the developers. And we could talk about that in the Q&A, but uh, one hunch is, is why they're so low is that maybe that they're not included in a, maybe a broader look at a data science project and they're kind of stuck just doing coding. So I'm, I'm, I want to study this in this year to understand why or, or how companies can improve the satisfaction of developers in, in the work that they do. And I think one, one thing to look at is team cohesiveness, is that if you, if you build a nice, strong data science team who collaborate well, who's, who speak weekly or daily about projects and maybe how the project's structured, I'm, I'm hoping that those, those kinds of, of developers working in those settings will be more satisfied with their jobs than developers who are stuck alone just doing coding. But again, that's an empirical question that I'd like to answer. All right. Um, so also, so I looked at at uh, you know how people talk about how hard it is to find a unicorn. Well, here's data to show you how how difficult it is to find somebody who's an expert in everything. So let's look at at each each colored bar. So let's focus on the intermediate, the the the, the dark blue bar here. So this means that that uh, I wanted to see how many people at least had an intermediate level of proficiency in any of the skills, right? <clears throat> the, the the five broad skills. We see that 22% indicate they had no, they had no skill sets above intermediate, um, which is I find kind of surprising. Uh, we see that there was 10% of the people had five who, who were proficient in five or more skills at, at the intermediate level. Okay, and if you look at if you go further and further advanced to expert, it's an expert. We have 96% who weren't an expert in anything. Okay, if you go to the right, we had. Uh, three percent were an expert in one skill, and one percent was if, was uh, proficient, was an expert at two skills. So the whole notion of finding somebody who knows everything about data science is is an impossibility. So this, that's why I always talk about data science being a team sport. Is that you have to work with people who have skills that you don't have, and you can complement each other's skills and drive your your data science projects forward. And I'll show you how to do that coming up using the scientific method, or why you can do that, or, or why it's useful to think in those terms. 
So I wanted to see the impact of your teammate skills on your work performance. So I asked basically if they work with a team or alone, and if they work with a team, I wanted, to indica I wanted them to indicate if they have an expert on their team in a given area. So this one, I want to focus on, on the impact of the business expert. So you look, you look at the left side, the, the three left bars, this is a satisfaction for each of the job roles when there is no business expert on a team as, as your teammate. You look at the right hand side, this is with an, a business expert on the team. And we find that data scientists who have business experts on their team are, are more satisfied with their work outcome when, than when they don't have a, 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 a business person on the team. And these, this held for, for researchers as well as developers. So developers and researchers can be, can, be more, can be happier about the work that they do when they're paired up with somebody who knows about the business. And that makes sense because the business person knows what kind of questions to ask and what kinds of uh, projects need to be done. And so the developer and the researcher can spend time focusing on and addressing those particular business questions. All right, let's look at <clears throat> this next slide. Let's see. I must cover it up for me. There we go. Uh, so this one was for the impact of technology and programming expert. And for this, I didn't find any impact on your teammate having an, being an expert in technology or programming. So it didn't matter if, you, if your teammates uh, were experts or not on programming. It didn't impact your, your level of satisfaction with your work outcome. And finally, we're going to look at the impact of uh, math and modeling and statistics on, on, on team performance or in, in the team function. So on the left-hand side, the left chart, we see that, that the, the presence of a math expert on your team will increase the satisfaction of your business manager, who's a data scientist, as well as the researcher. On the right, we see that the, the, the introduction of an expert who on stats in your team will have a significant impact on the satisfaction of your business management uh, data scientist. Without, it, with, without a, a stats person on the team, satisfaction is about midpoint from zero to 10 scale, uh, whereas if you have an expert on stats on your team, the business manager is significantly happier at about a, a 7.0 rating on a zero to 10 scale. It's a pretty big jump. So what this tells me is that you, know, you need to think about data science as a team sport and get people on your team who are experts on things that, that you're not an expert on, and that will necessarily enhance the, the outcome of your work. So how do, so how do teams get together and, and how do you, you know, encourage them to work together uh, the, from the business manager to the developer, technologist, uh, and the researcher? How do you get them to work together? So I like to approach problems using the scientific method. It's a simple five-step process, and it starts with formulating the question, right? You start with a problem statement. If you're, if you're a customer success manager company, you want to decrease churn, your, your problem statement would be, you know, how do I decrease churn, okay? And then the step two in the scientific method is you have to generate some hypotheses or some hunches, basically things you want to test to see if, if, your, if your ideas come true or not. Step three is you gather the data. You could either do that with experiment or just simple observation and just collect data and see what patterns emerge. Uh, also, I encourage clients to integrate their data silos because the, the sum of your data is greater than the sum of your data. So if you want to get you know, better insights, so the more data you have, the better, especially if you have the capability of machine learning and the next step on analyze, analyze data and test hypotheses. If you have a, a lot of data, the data science doesn't have the time to sift through all, that, all the, the, the metrics. So if you have machine learning, that'll easily surface some insights that you may have missed as a, as a lone data scientist. And the final step is take action or communicate the results. And that's when you, you know, you either you tell your executives kind of things that you found, or maybe you, you've developed a machine learning algorithm that you can put into a recommendation engine that'll automate that process. And with each, each of these steps, step four, you can go back to generating new hypotheses or from five different new hypotheses based on what you find and so forth. So it's a continuous cycle of, of testing ideas, implementing them and, and relearning and, and going in a cycle, a virtuous cycle. So, you may ask, well, Bob, so how does that work? How does, so if I have data science, data science on my team, how do I get them to work on a project? So I, I developed this, 
it's kind of heuristic to show that of these five uh, scientific uh, method steps, one through five on the left-hand side, you cross those with the three broad data science skill sets, then you can start seeing how the, the, the different data scientists can impact different steps of the scientific method. So in the first two one, you gotta formulate the question and generate hypotheses, and that's typically driven by the business manager of the team who knows the business, who knows what kinds of questions to ask. Uh, and this, by the way, like I said, this, the business is just focused just on, because I've used data science as a business. If you were studying you know, um, cancer treatment, you wanna have somebody who's an expert on, in oncology who knows about you know, cancer proteins and things like that, who, who knows what kind of questions to ask. Right, so the business person can touch touches primarily steps one, two, and five of the scientific method. Right, the technology and programmer uh, data scientist it has a big impact on gathering and generating the data. Um, I know that when I work on big big data projects, I always rely on, on technologists because I don't have that skill set. So, if without them, I'd be uh, just managing small data sets my entire life. And then finally, the stats and math we see here that they primarily impact. The, the final three steps, gather, generate data, analyze data, and communicate the results, just based on, on their skill set. So, so this is kind of like a nice heuristic you can follow of, of how your team can get together. Maybe it'd be a nice way to kind of introduce your data science team to this kind of notion that you know, it does take a, a team to have a successful data science project, and these are the reasons why. So I wanted to see, of, of those 25 data science skills, which ones were really primarily driving the satisfaction with the work outcome? So I looked at correlations between each of those 25 skill sets, the ratings, along, and correlated each of those with the measure of satisfaction. And I found here, I just overlaid the top five and the bottom five uh, data science skills. And we see here that for each of the, <clears throat> each of the, the, the data science roles, one of the top skills that drove satisfaction with the work outcome was the data mining and biz tools. So, and that was true for business manager. It was a number two driver of their success on their project. For developer, it was a number four. Creatives, it was number two. And researchers, it was number two. Which I found, I mean, this, this makes sense to be a researcher. You need data mining and biz tools. That's part of your job. But I was surprised to see both for developer and business manager that just having that skill set Made you, made you more successful on your project. And down below, here's the bottom four drivers of, of success on projects. And we hear that budgeting is, was across the board one of the lowest, uh, had lowest impact on project success. And that, and again, this is just, a, remember this is just a survey that we developed, so maybe the next round I do a survey, I'm gonna leave that, that question out of there because it didn't add much to the uh, predictive power of, of a project success. All right, so again, this is a similar kind of graph I showed you earlier, but this, instead of, this, instead of like the competency, this is the impact that each skill set has on project outcome, okay? So essentially looking at the correlation between proficiency ratings of each skill and how satisfied they are with, with their work that they do. And this, here's the key, the code down here. It's greater than, the correlation is greater than 0 0.40, you have a big bullet and it, it decreases down to a small bullet when the correlation is below 0 0.20. And again, interestingly, uh, for business managers here, the, the top uh, role on this chart, big drivers of project success, again, were data mining and biz tools, followed by uh, stats and statistical modeling. And you see here down below, some of those business skills are, are not really predictive of their project success. So I encourage any kind of business manager out there who thinks you know, they don't need to be skillful in, in stats or data mining and biz tools, I would encourage you to learn about that stuff and try to adopt some of those tools in your, your current job. Because if you do, you'll be more successful in the job than if you don't. So next I looked at uh, education. So again, I had, a, I had a question about their education status. So they could either pick like tech, tech program, two year degree, four year degree, master's degree, and PhD, right? So if you look at, if you look at on here on the left hand side, this is for overall the for the entire data set. Saw that if you're if you have a PhD, you you tend to be more proficient in uh, science and math. If that makes sense, or some of these stats and math. Um, although it didn't it didn't seem to have a big impact on other areas like uh, programming 
or even even business. If you got a PhD, you actually have lower proficiency in business skills, which, which I thought was interesting. And that could be the function of the fact maybe the, these PhDs were primarily focused on maybe uh, uh, academic research uh, jobs. That's that's something I I, I just don't know. Uh, so the next I looked at the the three different kinds of data scientists that we had ample data on. There were business management, developers, and researchers. And we see here that in developers. The difference between a BS and a master's degree is negligent. There's, there's no difference. So you're not more proficient in programming if you have a master's degree than if you have a four-year degree on average. Okay. If you look at the business management, we see here that there's a, a, a difference across all these five skill sets if you have a master's degree compared to if, if you have a four-year degree. The ones that were statistically significant actually uh, steps math and programming so you just, you just have more more proficiency in those areas and down below we see researchers see that phds have the most proficiency in both stats and math and modeling compared to master's degree, master's degree students and four degree students so again education does seem to have an impact on your proficiency but only for certain kinds of data scientists again for developers it appears that getting a master's degree doesn't make you more proficient in, in uh, data science skills that are related to big data projects. And finally, look at uh, lack of, look at gender diversity uh, among data scientists. And I'm not surprised with these results. I looked at other technology companies and you get pretty much the same results. So typically, uh, females make up a very small percent of the data scientists, on average about 25% across overall. We hear that that they were they appeared mostly in as researchers. So of researchers, 32% were female, 68% were male. So it's, it's predominantly a male-dominated uh, profession, not surprisingly. And I wanted to look at other 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 uh, occupations in the field of of science to see what what their makeup was in terms of of gender diversity. And again, for these three on the right, you got chemists, computer mathematical occupations, and environmental scientists. See here that again, they're primarily made up of of, uh, of men, okay. Whereas these over here on the left hand side, uh, biology and medical students or science scientists, they tend to be kind of roughly half half women and half men. So if you're a recruiter looking for you know a researcher in data science and looking to build up your the number of women in your company, you may want to focus on maybe recruiting people who are in biology students or maybe medical students because there there's a lot of women in those industries. And I looked at just comparing, so if you were a woman, you tended to be primarily a researcher. You self-identify as a researcher. About 72% indicated they were in a research role. Uh, whereas men, to kind of cut across the board, the highest is still researcher, but there were a lot more developers compared to the, the, the females in the sample as well. So females tend to be more researchers. Men tend to be, even though they do, they do research, they tend to be more on the, on the developer side and the business management side, not surprisingly. So also one last thing, looking at uh, uh, educational attainment for men and women, the left hand side is a woman, the right is male. It was here that they're roughly the same. Uh, most of the, the sample had at least a master's degree. So we have over like 66, 65% of the respondents had a master's degree or a PhD. And, and even, even almost all of them had at least a four year degree. So it's a very highly educated group. And there's tend to be no difference between men and women who are practicing data scientists right now. They can have the same degree and the same background. So I want to look at proficiency across, and I'm only presenting these business managers and researchers on, on this slide because that's we had ample data on that. For the other, other job roles, we didn't have enough data to make any strong comparisons. So I want to see if proficiency and skills varied across uh, gender. And we see here that roughly uh, men and women have the same proficiency in various data science skills. If you're a business manager, Men may have a slight advantage in business knowledge, but the other ones, it's roughly the same. For the researchers, again, um, men are slightly higher, but not much higher. And especially for math and stats, women are on par with men in their proficiency of, of, of knowledge in that skill set. So, so women are competent, so bring them on board. So I ending with a few advice for some data scientists out there. 
So when you talk about data scientists, be specific. So as I showed here, there are different kinds of data scientists, and each data scientist has their own skill set. So if you're a developer, you tend to be proficient in things like programming and technology. If you're a researcher, you tend to be proficient in things like stats and math. And if you're a business manager data scientist, you tend to be knowledgeable in, in, in business acumen, okay? So it, it's funny, I have, I have a twin brother who's a computer scientist who works for a, a local company here in Seattle, and he's, he's also a data scientist. They call him a data scientist, and people call me a data scientist. We have no overlapping skills. So again, I encourage you to kind of you know, be clear when you talk about, you know, I'm a data scientist, and clarify what, uh, what kind your, or, or where your strengths lie at least, okay? And because of that, I, I think you need to work with other data professionals who have complementary skills to your own, okay? Not, not everybody, or in fact, nobody is, is an expert in everything. So find people who are experts in their, you know, certain skill sets and work with them to drive your project forward, okay? And also, no matter what kind of data scientist you are, I encourage each one of you to learn some sort of data mining and visualization tool because we showed that that was a, a big driver of whether or not the data scientists were happy with their work outcome, okay? And you can use such programs like R. Some of the data scientists at Apuri use R and Python. Uh, I use SPSS. Uh, but there are a whole host of, of data mining tools out there that I encourage you to at least explore. And finally, be an advocate for women in the field of data science. As we showed here, uh, the women are just as competent. There, there's, there, there was no difference in job satisfaction between men and women. So I encourage you to, you know, if you're running a conference, invite women to speak. If you're hiring data scientists, I encourage you to look at maybe certain industries that may, may have more women research data scientists than others. But encourage, you know, young women from grade school, middle school, high school, college to, to get into math, programming, technology, things like that. And that's it. Great, thanks Bob. I had uh, my microphone on mute. No problem, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I, I just love it when somebody actually has numbers to back up what they're talking about. So, some interesting stuff there. I'm gonna Thanks. Okay, you just switched and I lost the questions. We're gonna open it up to questions in one second. Um, I wanted to start by asking you, were you, uh, was anything in particular a surprise to you as you went through it? Uh, a lot of this it seems like it, it backed up some of your um, expectations, but. Um, well, I was mainly surprised at how how clear the results were. I'm, I'm always kind of afraid to do surveys research primarily because it's all self-report data. That's why you gotta be careful when you, when you phrase the questions and the, especially the, for the 25 skill proficiencies, right? I needed to develop a scale that I would hope that people aren't inflating their ratings because people right. tend to be better or say that they're better than they are. But with results here, I found that, that most people were not you know, didn't reach that, that level of 60, that intermediate level of proficiency. So that leads me to believe that they're actually, these ratings reflect their real skill sets. So that was kind of encouraging. And also, I was also surprised to see how clear th those three factors were. You know, I'm always, I'm always skeptical when people talk without any data to back it up. So that's one of the reasons why I did the study to see like, are there really three underlying skills to, to data science? And through the factor analysis of those 25 skills, we see clearly that those, those three, three kind of skill sets emerge, kind of the quantitative skill sets versus the, the technology programming skill sets versus the subject matter expertise skill set. So I was surprised at how clear the, that, that factor solution was. And also just, it's, it's nice when you have hypotheses that you test and they come out in support of your hypothesis. So I'm always surprised sure. when that happens because you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's guesswork, it's, it's science, right? You could be right, you could be wrong. So I was, I was kind, of, kind of shocked to see the impact of, of the team on your performance. So if you had an expert, like if you're a business manager, you're more happy with your work if, you, if you're paired up with somebody who's good with, with stats. And that makes sense to me because when you look at data projects, they necessarily involve the analysis of data. And if you're a business expert who doesn't have expert expertise in that area of analyzing data, you need somebody with good quant skills. Otherwise, right. your project's gonna fail. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think it was your slide 24 that talked about that. Um, that was the thing that I had never really considered, and I think it's probably one of the great 
lessons from what you've been doing here in terms of, right, what are the, um, uh, is that what you were talking about? Uh, there was a slide that, that talked about the impact for each category on the other category. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, when we talk about uh, analytics and putting together teams and for, for data science, um, I just think that that's something that is so often overlooked or it's a, you know, a last minute thing. For me, the, the most surprising thing, you know, I say this almost tongue in cheek, but was that for the um, developers rating themselves highest on communication skills, because that hasn't really been, been my experience, but it, it, right. it's an interesting thing. Um, so it, uh, I want to open it up to some of the, um, the audience, the participants' questions. And let's see if we can get back there. Um, Shannon, you normally do this for me. I'm looking to see questions. I hope she didn't leave me alone here. I'm, I know, I'm uh -oh. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do we have here? With my sound issues today, you know, there's, there's questions that are coming in, you know. Uh, the most recent question is, would you recommend having at least one level of expertise in each of the three factor areas versus having high uh, profici proficiency in all factor areas within your silo? Yeah, I would, I would recommend finding at least somebody who has advanced knowledge in a given topic area and work with them. Like we said, I remember the, the creatives, the creative data scientists, the self identified as hackers or more creative people. They weren't strong in any one field, you know, any one skill set. And we found that the presence of them, I mean, it, it, nothing affects their behavior or their performance or their attitude about the work they do. Because I, I think in order to be successful, you have to be at least have advanced knowledge of a given topic area. And that's general, I think that's a general statement for any kind of skill set. If you're not good at something, the, if you're asked to do something, you know, in data analysis, for example, and you don't know stats, I think you're going to suffer and you're not going to be happy with the work that you do. Mm. And so I think you need to be, you know, work with people who are the best that you can find in that area, at least, at least have an advanced knowledge. And how, and how do you determine that? I mean, you look at, you know, resumes, uh, past work, you know, and job interview questions. Uh, but still focus on getting the best. And 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 the point I'm trying to make in that one is that is that if if you do find somebody who's going to say stats, they probably are not going to be good in programming or technology. That's just and they, they might be, but the chances are they're not. So it so data science is necessarily a team sport because people are going to have their one or two strengths, and that's about it. So if you want to have a complete data science team, get experts in all those three areas: technology stats and subject matter expertise. Yeah, I think one of the other things that I really appreciate you bringing out there was uh, using the scientific method as your approach to the questions that you're asking. What are you looking for in the data set? And as you pointed out, you know, that starts with somebody who understands the business because they know what you're going to, to need. Um, and, and perhaps exactly. depending on the type of analysis you're doing, you know, you're using uh, <laughs> data science in general business analysis, or are you doing it for uh, operational or long-term forecasting? If it's a sort of a bigger project, that uh, the need for the different skills will come in phases. So you have to start out by understanding right. what the business problem is. And as your slide pointed out, the, the folks with the technology expertise can come a little later. But right after the business, you need the, uh, the stats ability. Because Frankly, uh, business people may ask questions that can't be answered with the data that you have. Exactly, exactly. I, I do like the scientific method and other other methods I've seen on the web, like other pundits and, and consultants. Even though they make up their own terms to describe their their particular method, it still follows roughly the scientific method. It's you know you have you, you got to start with a problem statement, like like why are we even doing this project? Because if you don't even have that. You'll just end up analyzing data, which which can be fun. I've done that many times in my life. It, like late at night, you got a data set, you just start you know, looking at stuff. But typically, you want to have a, a purpose of why you're doing this analysis, and that'll guide where you're going. And and I'm not saying this is like you have to do this every time, but I think it's a good approach. It it, it makes it makes you critically think about not only the problem you're asking, but how do you actually operationalize it and and define your metrics that are used in your in your analytics. So, 
you know, additional question coming in, you know, how do you best promote a data science strategy in a non-data centric enterprise? Oh, that's, well, I, that's a simple question. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I'm, do, I'm doing a, some uh, research project right now looking at the difference between analytical leaders and analytical laggards. And, and, that, and analytical leader are companies that use uh, analytics to get a competitive advantage versus the, the laggards who, who, who don't have that ability to do that. And I find that there are differences between those lead, companies that are leaders versus laggards on a host of things around how they, how they build up their, their, their customer program, whether it be customer experience, customer success, what have you. And I find that analytical leaders tend to have a lot more executive support. So initially, you gotta have people up the top who believe in this, who actually use data to make decisions and talk and can talk about it intelligently. One of the things I stress to my, my clients is that I encourage the, the, the top brass of companies to at least take an introductory course on statistics or math, just to be comfortable with numbers and, and what, what they can tell you and what they mean and what they can't tell you. So, so top executive support, and also sharing the results company-wide is another big differentiator between analytical leaders and laggards. So make sure you share your, 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 your results, not only you know, inside your company, but also outside to like conferences. So you, the people know who you are, you know, and maybe you'll get feedback at a conference on your project, maybe it'll make you better. Um, also, I, I found that analytical leaders tended to use uh, like more of the latest technology like machine learning capabilities and they have more access or better access to data scientists on their team than analytical laggards uh, and also they they tend to use customer data platforms something that kind of automates insights so so there are many things that differentiate leaders and laggards but if you want to start with something i think start with leadership and, and get them on board and, and get them talking about the value of data in analytics Thanks. Sure. All right, so you know, what are some of the, you know, best practices, Bob, you know, in be tying between data science and analytics, uh, you know, business analysis and, um, you know, how, what are you seeing, you know, practically that's, uh, how many, have the benefits that it's bringing to um, businesses? Well, I don't have any research on that particular question. I could just, just speak just through experience. I think, I think you need to be clear with with the things you're 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 measuring that's why i like the scientific method because it, it makes you be critical about the questions you're asking and how you define them because because when when you pose questions you want to make sure that that these questions are testable you can't just you know look at at a static you know a, a average something and say it draws some like deep meaningful conclusions about that so be clear about what you're trying to predict and develop measures that are good measures of that construct it's one of the biggest problems I see in the area of customer experience and customer success management is that people define these or just use throw, throw around terms like, for example, customer engagement. And <laughs> it means two different things for different people. And if you're, and you're measuring engagement from a survey, then I want you to look at the questions and, and tell me how, how is that metric different than other metrics you may have used or may have called something else. Like, for example, I, I often hear the words customer loyalty, customer sat, and customer engagement uh, used, you know, in the same, in the same article, when you, when you look at the questions, they're roughly the same questions. So you're just measuring just an overall attitude. So be clear with what you're measuring, define it, and be clear with what, what kind of outcomes you're looking for. And I think that's a big problem. If you can, if you can solve that problem, be clear with your measurement. I think that's, that's a good first step in a, in a great project. Great. Can I just uh, jump in there, Shannon, because mm -hmm. you were asking about, um, uh, sort of business analysis, and I see as I'm trying to go through the thread here that someone had asked about uh, business analysis since that was in the um, the original title in the we we're talking about you know how it maps to um, Bob's research. I think one of the things and one of the reasons I wanted to cover this topic uh, in this forum is you know the, we talk about big data all the time. We talk about uh, analytics. We talk about uh, data scientists. To me, when we look at sort of making business decisions, there are kind of two major categories. You know, you can have uh, a data-driven decision, but you can also have a data-driven strategy. And sometimes what happens is uh, when we're doing business analysis, trying to figure out uh, the strategy, and I've talked about this in a couple of the other 
uh, webinars, going back to some of the stuff I did teaching in business school, you know, trying to figure out what you want to be as a business, those are the kind of questions that require different analysis um, rather than something where you're uh, doing customer satisfaction, you release something, you're doing A-B testing, whatever that may be, and you want to say, well, okay, what's the result? And I think both of those are amenable to the type of um, use of the scientific method that Bob outlined here, and both of those are uh, things that you can improve. I want to say both, I'm not talking about sort of tactical decision making versus overall strategy. Uh, if you take the time up front to think of, if, if you want to be data driven uh, and, and really understand, make your decisions based on data, um, this approach of building a team, making it a team sport, is so important. I used to do some management workshops with a fellow who said that he'd interviewed uh, managers at companies all around the world, and the one that stuck in his mind was that he said that. Uh, decisions in their company was always made by you know, gut feel and basically whoever had the, the biggest gut was the one that had the biggest uh, impact. And you know, I'll, I'll just toss in one more data point and then you can do with this as you like. I also worked with someone else uh, who's a, a well-known name in the industry and they were uh, doing a TV commercial and we showed up at the studio and they hadn't had to wear a suit in a while because they were I'll just say they didn't need to, and realized that the suit jacket didn't fit. And so sitting him down, they ripped the jacket right at the back, because you're only being shot from the front. And that's when I came up with my own law of success, which is the Brooks Brothers law of success. And if you ever look at uh, Brooks Brothers, they generally have three lines of suits. And the more expensive the suit, the smaller the difference between the chest size and the waist size. And that goes with the gut feel. Is, you know, my own data that <clears throat> as you reach a certain level, uh, and that's backed up by empirical evidence. Um, and the only reason I say that is because I think that that is something that we can look at as some things are, are backed up by data, some things are backed up by intuition, and if you really want to be able to justify uh, for your business analysis, uh, the way to do it is to, to follow the guidelines or the recommendations. It wasn't put that way in, the, in Bob's presentation, but this whole team approach and when you need which skill, I think is something that people really should be looking at. And I haven't seen them look at it anywhere else. Cool. Shannon, do we have any more? Uh, no, it was just uh, that was it for questions. But we are just you know coming up right at the top of the hour. Top of the hour, you know, and to answer the most common question that we have had throughout the presentation is just a reminder that I will send a follow up email by end of day Monday, with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session, um, as well as the information to contact Bob. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this month. It's been a pleasure you. having you as guest speaker, and and Adrian, thanks as always. Thanks. And, and thanks. Thank I really appreciate the offer. Thank you very much, guys. We'll talk thank to you. you. Thanks. Bye. Take care, folks.